since uh, I'm very early on in my career, so this is basically going to be uh, an overview of very well established facts uh, in ophthalmic sickle cell management and diagnosis and uh, maybe some data on uh, sickle cell disease in India. So the ocular manifestations of sickle cell disease as in the rest of the body result from vascular occlusion and the major sites involved are the conjunctiva, iris, retina and the choroid. For an ophthalmologist, the basic differentials we have to offer, apart from sickle cell disease in the eye, are more other, uh, other important causes of occlusion like central retinal vein occlusion, Eels disease, and retinopathy secondary to diabetes. So coming to a very famous anterior segment sign, the conjunctival comma sign. This is most commonly seen in patients with sickle cell disease and uh, is in fact the most common ophthalmological sign used by pediatricians to suspect sickle cell disease, since this is easily visible on torchlight examination too. The comma uh, sign denotes the presence of short truncated blood vessels, especially in the lower bulbar conjunctiva, which is one of the most accessible sites for torchlight examination. So as you can see, the right picture gives us a fluorescein angiogram of the conjunctival vessels, which shows short truncated blood vessels in the conjunctiva. Iris sectoral atrophy is another very specific sign in patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, like sickle cell crisis affects uh, other bodily vasculature, it also affects the iris vasculature, particularly the radial iris vessels. And the presence of uh, this sign is also very closely associated, according to some studies, with proliferative sickle cell retinopathy, which is one of the most uh, deadly forms of sickle cell disease in the eye. So. Uh, to keep a watch out for iris sectoral atrophy and prompt referral to an ophthalmologist. Elevated intraocular pressure, this is a very common problem in patients with sickle cell disease and is a medical emergency in them. So blood in the anterior chamber uh, occurs very commonly and the sickle blood cells, they clog the trabecular meshwork uh, which is actually responsible for outflow of the aqueous from the eye. And apart from this, sickle cell patients are actually more prone than the general population to develop central retinal artery occlusion and optic atrophy. And both of these cause a permanent and very quick irreversible visual loss. So we cannot allow the IOP to exceed 25 millimeters of mercury for more than 24 hours. Prompt action needs to be taken. And this is one uh, disease or one sign which is e important even in patients with sickle cell trait. So the main goals of treatment of elevated intraocular pressure in patients with sickle cell disease are to decrease the risk of re-bleeding. Corneal blood staining, this is another thing which may require further on a penetrating keratoplasty or a corneal transplant and atrophy of the optic nerve. So supportive measures like elevating the head at night could help and uh, controlling any increase in intraocular pressure with topical medications. Uh, one thing I would like to point out here is that Oral drugs like acetazolamide are better avoided in these patients since they create a more acidotic environment and promote sickling of red blood cells. Surgery is another option in patients, uh, so we can give them an anterior chamber wash to dislodge the blood in the anterior chamber and uh, in uncontrolled cases you can go ahead with a trabeculectomy which is a definitive procedure for decreasing intraocular pressure. Coming to the posterior segment manifestations. So this is background sickle retinopathy or non-proliferative retinopathy. The major uh, signs which, include, uh, which are included in this subheading are venous tortuosity, salmon patch hemorrhage, and black sunburst and angioid streaks. So this picture on the right uh, shows us a salmon patch hemorrhage which is actually uh, occurring due to a burst or a blowout of the retinal arterioles which are occluded because of sickling of the uh, blood vessels. And uh, this can occur in between the retina and the vitreous, in the vitreous or below the retina. The picture on the left here shows us uh, angioid streaks, which are radial streaks or breaks in the Brooks membrane, and uh, which project from the optic nerve. And these are important because they may cause disciform scars, which are again a uh, cause of permanent visual loss in these patients. Proliferative retinopathy. So this is where we have to stress upon in these patients. This is a most severe ocular change. And uh, one thing to point out is the peripheral retinal changes are more frequent in double heterozygotes than in homozygotes. So there are a couple of hypotheses why this occurs. One reason is that the homozygous patients do not live long enough to actually manifest these changes. And uh, another hypothesis is that 
There is a complete occlusion in patients with uh, homozygous sickle cell disease. So the retina becomes completely anoxic and there is no stimulus actually for any uh, vascular endothelial growth factors. Hence, this does not cause proliferation because that is the major uh, mediator of neovascularization in the eye. In contrast, the patients with uh, double heterozygous sickle cell disease or the HBSC patients uh, actually have relatively hypoxic areas which are a, a very major impetus or a stimulus for uh, vascular endothelial growth factor to be released from the retina. So these patients are actually more prone to proliferative sickle cell disease. This disease is progressive, so the desirable objective here is to treat the neovascular tissue before a vitreous hemorrhage occurs. So there is a classical uh, staging of proliferative sickle cell disease by Goldberg, where the first stage, uh, in the first stage there are peripheral arteriolar occlusions. In the second stage we have arteriolar venular anastomosis. So up to this stage, sickle cell disease is almost clinically invisible. But the third stage where we have neovascular proliferation is the stage where we actually go in and treat the patient. Vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachments are the final stages where you actually have to go in and operate. So this picture on the left, it shows us a tractional retinal detachment along with vitreous hemorrhage along the inferior arcade. And the picture on the right shows us a very uh, nice C-fan neovascularization, which is a very classical sign in patients with sickle cell disease with neovascularization. So this C-fan actually develops between the uh, perfused and the non-perfused areas at that junction. So treatment of posterior segment changes. Our goal here is to eliminate the existing neovascularization and the sequelae of proliferative sickle cell retinopathy. Surgical procedures uh, we use when there are retinal detachments, a non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage or epiretinal membranes. All these are causes of severe or profound visual loss in patients with sickle cell disease. So there has been a study in Western India which shows there is a 71% incidence of anterior segment ischemia in patients with proliferative sickle cell retinopathy who undergo a particular procedure called scleral buckling to settle their uh, retina and tractional detachments. So this is again a very, very difficult to manage complication and is, prevention is always better than cure in these cases. Laser photocoagulation is the first step in the management of sickle cell retinopathy. So laser can be done in uh, various modalities. The first one is where we actually uh, burn out the feeder vessels. So there is no supply to the neovascular frond and it regresses. A second uh, way in which we can treat by laser is giving a focal scatter in that particular quadrant of neovascularization. And the gold standard in more uh, widespread uh, proliferation is full scatter or peripheral circumferential scatter. So this is done uh, nowadays using uh, argon lasers, which are uh, have, which have less complications than xenon arc laser used previously. They could actually themselves cause retinal detachment or choroidal neovascular membranes. Surgical treatment uh, is by scleral buckling as I had mentioned earlier. In scleral buckling what we do is we place a silicon band around the equator. The first picture shows us the silicon band which is passed underneath the muscles around the equator of the eye. So this basically physically causes a counter traction at the eye and allows the retina to settle down or uh, go back to its original place. Vitro-retinal surgeries are performed in cases where there are more widespread retinal detachments or macular membranes. So the picture on the left, it shows us a pick with which you actually go into the eye and pull, pull out or peel off the epiretinal membranes which develop in these patients. So a small gauge instrument is used to enter the eye, whichever may be required, and uh, that helps to cut off the traction and with internal tamponade using either silicon oil or gas, uh, we settle the retina down. Uh, coming to some Indian data on sickle cell disease, so this suggests that heterozygotes are actually affected earlier than homozygous patients, 15 years versus 29 years. Homozygous patients have uh, ophthalmic manifestations in 36% of these patients, but less than 5% of them have ophthalmic symptoms of uh, visual loss. So they are more peripherally occurring changes than central. So the patient may not actually re recognize any visual changes. So this highlights the importance of screening early, which can prevent visual disability from proliferative sickle retinopathy. But there is no data available in India on uh, screening protocols. So this is where we actually need to work. Paloricturis conjunctival vascular changes, the anterior segment changes are observed in a very large majority, about 90% of these patients. And the posterior segment signs are retinal vessel dilatation, tortuosity, observed in 30% of the patients, which are not visually threatening, but are actually signs for us to actually go in and look peripherally, where there may be neovascularization developing. 
There are a few recent advances in the diagnosis and management of patients with sickle cell disease in the eye. The diagnostics, we have fluorescein angiography, which picks up clinically invisible proliferative changes. This picture on the right shows us that there is a clear demarcation between the vascular and avascular retina in a patient with sickle cell disease. So the avascular retina is where, and the junction is where the neovascularization is occurring. So we know where exactly we need to go in and laser to prevent any further complications. And ultra wide field imaging gives us a 200 degree view of the retina. Since proliferative sickle cell retinopathy is uh, more a peripheral disease than central, it is very important to look peripherally. Standard fundus imaging just gives us a 30 degree view. But now we have ultra wide field imaging which gives us a 200 degree view. So we can pick up any changes in the peripheral retina early. And surgical advances are the use of small gauge vitrectors. We now have 29 gauge vitrectomy, which means just a 0.3 millimeter instrument with which we can go inside the eye and increased cut rates of 5,000 cuts per second. So in tractional detachments, it's very important when we operate to not produce more traction while cutting. So this high cut rate actually helps us in developing a faster and a more non-traumatic non surgery in these patients. We also have anti-VEGF agents like bevacizumab and ranibizumab, which can be injected intravitrally and which helps in regression of the neovascularization. This agent is more in uh, clinical trials now, so maybe in some more time you will get more concrete data. For near work, we have a larger variety like dome magnifiers, handheld magnifiers, spectacle magnifiers. So at least for near work, these patients are, uh, are not dependent on other people. Non-optical visual aids, we have uh, something called Notex in which the patients can use currency notes easily based on the size and the arrangement in this particular instrument and others like auditory watches, etc. So screening protocols for uh, sickle cell retinopathy have been advised as to start screening as early as 10 years of age in patients of, in the second decade itself. Rescreening of normal patients to occur every one or two years. A dilated fundus examination is what we mean by rescreening. <coughs> to look for any peripheral changes where we can intervene early and prevent the more debilitating manifestations. Retinal lesions become more prevalent up to the fifth decade of life. So screening these patients is a long process. You have to continue screening these patients till they reach maybe middle age and to keep a watch out for eye changes. So the prompt referral to an ophthalmologist or a retinal specialist in case you're suspecting anything based on anterior segment science is the key. And awareness, as we all know, is actually the major point where we have to stress on these patients. So this uh, uh, has been more or less uh, an overview of established facts. And uh, I would like more support since I am going to uh, start in my ophthalmic practice in a place where we have a high prevalence of sickle cell disease. So thank you very much for your patience.